हेलो वेलकम टू एनालिस्ट डेटेड 26th ऑफ सितंबर 2023 टुडे वी विल लुक एट फाइव इंपॉर्टेंट आर्टिकल्स फ्रॉम द इंडियन एक्सप्रेस एंड द हिंदू द फर्स्ट आर्टिकल विल बी रिगार्डिंग द पीवी नरसिम्हा राव केस दैट इज ऑफ 1998 देन वी विल लुक एट द हाइड्रोजन इकॉनमी देन वी विल टेक अप अ रिपोर्ट ऑफ डब्ल्यूएचओ ऑन हाइपरटेंशन then we'll take up the uighur region and finally we'll look at the asola bhatti wildlife sanctuary now let's start with the first article and this pertains to your gs2 indian constitution now this is a very interesting case why let's look at the context so the supreme court said that it would reconsider the judgment that granted so what did this judgment grant so it granted some form of immunity immunity to whom to mps and mlas immunity from what from getting bribed or receiving bribe for what for exercising vote or to exercise a speech so let's take a simple example let's say i take a bribe and in return for the bribe i vote in a certain direction then i will have the immunity from prosecution prosecution why because i committed a crime of getting bribed right secondly if i make a speech let's say i take some money and i make a speech so again i will have the immunity if all those activities are being carried out in the parliament of india now let's understand this case so the backdrop was that our prime minister rajiv gandhi was assassinated then the kargil war was going on then there was the bofor scam then the government lost power in 1989 so it was a period of tumult simultaneously what happened is that a minority government was formed so let's say i have 100 seats and i am not able to prove my majority yet and let's say i have only support of 43 legislators so still i am able to form the government but at a later point of time i will have to prove my majority so this was a minority government and there was a hanging no confidence motion that means the majority had to be proved simultaneously we were staring at the 1991 macroeconomic crisis and when we talk about socio religious issues so we were looking at the ram janmabhoomi movement and the babri masjid demolition so in this backdrop this case came into light so what happened is that this minority government of pv narsimha rao was short of 14 legislators but overnight what happened during the date of no confidence motion the no confidence motion was defeated with the support of 265 members while they earlier had only 251 members that means they got 14 extra votes at a later point of time an fir by a leg- legislator so at a later point of time a legislator came front and registered a fir where with the cbi on two grounds a bribery and criminal conspiracy the idea was that there was bribery involved to buy the legislators so that to defeat the no confidence motion so this issue went before the supreme court and the supreme court had to decide something that whether or not article 105 of the indian constitution will be will it grant immunity to any mp and simultaneously we have article 194 so whether article 105 194 will grant immunity to member of parliament or member of legislative assembly in what context in the context that they are involved in any crime per se while exercising their right to vote or speech now this particular judgment is therefore in question these days because the chief justice of india dr d y chandrachud he has asked to reopen the case now let's look at the article 105 so article 105 deals with the privileges 
privileges of a parliamentarian. Now, why does a parliamentarian need some privileges? So, we as citizens, we have some rights. So, any ordinary Indian will have the rights enshrined in the fundamental rights. But why do we need some extra rights or some extra privileges? Because it's a representative democracy. So, if I and all of us in our constituency, if we together choose you as our representative, then you must have the muster and courage to speak and vote. Immaterial of fear or favor. So, you must be free to represent us. And therefore, certain privileges are granted to the parliamentarians. Now, let us go into the words of Article 104. So, 104 deals with powers, privileges of the House of Parliament and of members and committees thereof. Now, parallelly, we have Article 194 for the state assemblies and for the MLAs. Now, 1051 reads, subject to the provisions of this constitution and the rules and standing orders regulating the procedure of parliament, there shall be freedom of speech and parliament. Now, at this juncture, we must appreciate that while I have my fundamental right of speech under 191A, the rights of freedom of speech within the parliament by or granted to a legislator, to a member of parliament, is at a higher pedestal. What I am simply saying is that let us say this is our rights as citizens. So, the freedom of speech that a MP has is at a higher pedestal. So, they have broader speech rights. Second aspect is 102. So, no member of parliament shall be liable to any proceedings in any court in respect of anything said or any vote given by him in parliament or any committee thereof. That means, if I speak something and if I vote, I have some form of immunity. So, when I am literally speaking about these two words, speech and vote, I am essentially talking about free speech and free vote, that means I am willingly exercising the right to vote without any coercion, without any fear, without any favor. But whether or not giving a bribe and then getting a vote, does it amount to free vote? Does it amount to free speech? Or it is a violation of that. And that is why this case has been opened up. And this is the criticism of the judgment. Now, let us look at the decision itself. So, the decision was taken by a five-judge bench and it was a 3-2 split. So, what is the final judgment is that the people who took bribe, the legislators who took a bribe and then voted where on the no confidence motion, they have immunity. Why? Because this is, this right to vote, right to speech within the parliament, it is having immunity under article 1052 and 1942. On the other hand, if as a member of parliament, I only took a bribe, but there was no involvement of speech or voting. That means, let us say, I took 5 crores of bribe and I did not vote, I absconded or I was nowhere to be found. I did not attend the parliamentary proceedings. Then I will be prosecuted. This was the logic. This was the logic that was given to prosecute one of the legislators while the rest of the legislators went scot-free. So, the bribe-taking members of parliament who voted on the no-confidence motion are entitled to immunity from criminal prosecution for offences of bribery and criminal conspiracy. Why? Because it falls in the ambit of 1052. On the other hand, 
except in the case of ajit singh who unlike the other co accused did not cast his vote even though he got the bribe so ajit singh was prosecuted now what is the criticism of this judgment essentially there were two cases a there was bribery and in the second case also there was bribery with the bribery there was voting and here there was no voting now bribe in any form is a corrupt crime under the prevention of corruption act it's also a crime under ipc that simply means that whether or not i am voting or not immaterial of my vote bribery should be punished but what the court did in this case there was no punishment and in this case there was punishment so this was the fallacy so let's look at this the criticism that article 1052 confers immunity to a member of parliament from criminal prosecution only in respect of freedom of speech and right to give vote that simply means that these rights of speech and vote is only about free and fair voting so free speech and free and fair voting it is not about coercion it is not about bribery it is not about corrupt practices then it is only available in regard to these parliamentary activities or official activities and the moment whenever we define corruption what do we say the use of public office for private purpose so the biggest criticism is the moment i get involved in bribery what i am doing i am fulfilling my private purposes my private interest even though i am holding a public office so immaterial of whether i vote or not bribery must be punished and in no in no method or in no argument it can be justified that bribery and therefore voting is part of parliamentary activity now immunity is not available for any acts done in his private or personal capacity and offenses of bribery and criminal conspiracy having been done in personal capacity cannot be held to be acts done in discharge of parliamentary or official duties and these are the criticisms from some of the legal luminaries of india and it also shows that the judiciary as well as decisions are also not infallible that means they can also be debated criticized and are open to all kinds of opinions and scrutiny not only from legal luminaries but from all of us the second article is regarding green hydrogen and the hydrogen economy and this pertains to your gs3 economy as well as environment now let's look at the context so iucl indian oil commences trial of green hydrogen powered fuel buses now let's look at the prospects of this hydrogen economy so the world is looking at a demand of 70 million metric tons and india consumes 8.5% of global hydrogen and whenever we are looking at the economic goals as well as the climate goals pertaining to cop 26 back in 2021 glasgow so we announced the panchamrita goals and here we promised the world of going net zero by 2070 and one of the panchamrita was that we will have 50% of our energy mix from renewable energy sources that simply means we are transitioning transitioning from carbon intensive power or energy towards green and clean energy 
Now, this transition must also be sustainable transition. What do we mean by sustainable energy transition? That simply means that I cannot go randomly and switch to one electricity source. That means, let's say this is my basket. And today, almost 70% of my energy is coming from carbon. So, in one year, I certainly cannot make it 50% and 50%. So, it will be a gradual process. Why? Because I am also expecting the size of power sector to also increase. That means we are also looking at a doubling of power demand from currently 400 gigawatts to 800 gigawatts by 2030. That means the size of the pie will also increase. That means we cannot stop the use of carbon intensive energy sources. That means this will also increase and the renewable energy sources will also increase. Now, let's understand this pie a little more. So, A, I have to increase the size from this to this. B, I have to move from let's say this much contribution from renewable sources to let's say 50%. But if I look at the 50% of renewable energy, then this 50% must also be clearly divided into multiple energy sources. Let's say solar, wind, green hydrogen. So, multiple sources. Why? Because whenever we look at our energy demands, we cannot depend on, let's say, solar, which fluctuates due to day and night then wind which fluctuates with wind direction and wind speed or with thermal power plant which takes let's say 24 hours to start generating at its full capacity so we need a sustainable energy mix we need a sustainable energy transition and within renewable energy we need a sustainable energy basket coming from multiple renewable energy sources and that also fulfills our ideas of net zero by 2070 and it also goes in the direction of the Panchamrita goals. Simultaneously, it also looks at decreasing the carbon intensity or CO2 emissions while also bridging the gap between renewable energy supply and the renewable energy demand. Now, let's look at the types of hydrogen. So, A, we will have grey hydrogen. Here, what we are doing is we are taking a carbon intensive source that is natural gas. So, let's say I am taking CH4 and then I am breaking it up into CO2 and hydrogen molecules. And therefore, as I am also adding CO2, so it will be called grey hydrogen. And we can also have black hydrogen which is more carbon intensive then we have blue hydrogen here what i am doing i am repeating the same process except for that the carbon is going for carbon sequestration it is stored in underground caverns what do we do with green hydrogen so here i am going for let's say solar power or let's say wind power or hydro power and I'm sourcing all this electricity to go for electrolysis. That means I am breaking H2O water into hydrogen and oxygen. That is the idea of green hydrogen. That means the input energy is also coming from renewable energy sources and this is done through electrolysis that is breaking of H2O with the help of electricity. Now, let's look at the supply chain. So, A, I am getting some renewable energy and I am going for electrolysis. Then, I am getting H2. This H2 I can directly use as fuel or I can go for transformation 
into synthetic fuels or green ammonia. Now, once I get the H2, I can ship it using containers, using ports, trucks, pipelines, and I can use it in the end use products. Whether we are talking about our fuel buses, whether we are looking at the cars, or we are simply powering the power plants again, or we are powering some industries, or we are becoming part of the hydrogen supply chain, or if we have extra production, we are going for exports. Now, what are the measures? So, the idea is to develop manufacturing capacity and capabilities. So, here, two examples is first the reliance industry. So, in private sector, the reliance industry and the Adani enterprises with Total Gas of France, they are working on individual projects of green hydrogen. Why? Because India is looking to tap the global demand of hydrogen as well as tap the domestic demands of hydrogen while also creating new demands for hydrogen economy. Simultaneously, we have to go for skilling and transmission networks and supply chains. Whenever we are talking about the entire supply chain, whether for production to storage, transportation and let's say exports. So, a hydrogen supply chain has to be created and the supply chain will have to be linked with the global hydrogen supply chain networks. Then, the incentives to switch to green hydrogen. Why? A lot of industry today are using H2, but they are either brown, grey or black. So, they have to gradually move towards green hydrogen. Even if it is blue hydrogen, we have to try to move them towards green hydrogen. Then going for strategic investment. And the strategic investment can very well be in form of incentives from the government of India as well as the state governments. Or they can be in terms of partnership with private players like we discussed. Then we have the national green hydrogen mission. Here, the idea is to incentivize commercial production of green hydrogen and to turn India into a net exporter. Then, going for decarbonization of the energy sector. Now, whenever we are looking at OPEC, what is the biggest source of threat? So, they take decarbonization. Or, essentially, we are saying that we are moving away from fossil fuels. So, this word itself, it irritates the OPEC and OPEC plus countries. Then, use in mobility applications, the way we are using it in Delhi, in buses. Then, going for lower dependence in terms of imports of fossil fuel. And this is what we were discussing in decarbonization. Then, to go for developing indigenous manufacturing capacity and to have a 5 million metric ton capacity of green hydrogen production annually. Now, what are the challenges? So, first is economic sustainability. Why? Because whenever we are going into a new sector, there is naturally a gestation period. Simultaneously, what do we see about hydrogen is that it is nascent both in terms of technology as well as the terms of finance that has been invested or available for the sector. And when we say finance available for the sector, that means how many global funds, funds are willing to bet on green hydrogen and why would they invest in green hydrogen and not prefer, let's say, solar or wind energy. Then the initial cost, cost of creating the plants, supply chain as well as going for technology transfers and these technology transfers which involve huge royalty compensation elements. Then the high maintenance cost of the entire hydrogen economy. So, these are the brief challenges. The third article pertains to you the WHO report on hypertension and this pertains to GS2 health. Now, let's look at the context. So, WHO has released 
a report on hyper tension now why this is an important issue is because in india what we are looking at is an increasing incidence of cardio vascular diseases and increasing incidence of lifestyle disorders or non communicable diseases and all of it is leading to higher out of pocket expenditure which affects typically the lower ranks of our society and most importantly it affects the most vulnerable of our society the most so let's look what is hypertension so we are essentially referring to high blood pressure now the issue is that it is mostly asymptomatic that means you will only get the symptoms when it converts into a secondary issue or disease then it requires regular checkup and unless there is a regular checkup whenever we go to a clinic it is usually undetected now the issue is that it is a undetected second is even if it is detected it is untreated and thirdly it has secondary diseases so hypertension and high blood pressure triggering other diseases affecting your kidneys your liver affecting your heart now what are the risk factors so these are divided into two so modifiable and non modifiable modifiable essentially refer to the lifestyle types of diseases so whenever we follow a unhealthy lifestyle whether it is unhealthy diet lack of physical activity tobacco use alcohol use or going for obesity or it can be non modifiable factors like age genetics coexisting diseases or comorbidities now what are the key findings of who so who says that if we are able to make 50% people of india manage their blood pressure then we will save 43 lakh lives in india more than 8 18 crore people they are affected by high bp then 63% of people are unaware of their conditions and only 30% of the people who know about their condition receive any medical treatment so they will go for treatment when the hypertension converts into a secondary issue let's say a cardiovascular issue then blood pressure can go undetected and therefore who recommends that the policy makers must first focus on awareness why because even if i am getting the cases detected people are not going for any medical treatment so awareness about the ramifications of hypertension is extremely essential and if we have high bp then it can lead to heart attacks heart strokes kidney failures as well as it can affect the eyes now how can we control hypertension so a good lifestyle a good food regime going for healthy diets so whether we are talking about millets we are talking about veggies and we are talking about macro micro balance so rather than the quantity of food we have to move towards the quality of food and a healthy lifestyle where we are moving away from trans fats and moving towards healthy fats then going for active lifestyle whether we are talking about let's say preventive healthcare we are going for 
योगा और एनी फॉर्म ऑफ एक्सरसाइज फिजिकल एक्टिविटी इज मस्ट टू ट्रिगर गुड हेल्थ थ्रू आउट दी बॉडी देन क्विटिंग ड्रिंकिंग क्विटिंग स्मोकिंग एंड लिमिटिंग सोल्ट इन टेक एंड दैट टू इंप्रूव इन दी क्वालिटी ऑफ सोल्ट वाइल ऑल्सो डिक्रीजिंग द क्वांटिटी ऑफ सोल्ट देन स्ट्रेस मैनेजमेंट ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ हाइपर टेंशन फ्रॉम मेडिकल प्रोफेशनल्स एंड रेगुलर चेकअप ऑफ ब्लड प्रेशर वेन एवर वी विजिट दी क्लिनिक्स देन मैनेज अदर मेडिकल कंडीशन वाई बिकॉज इट कैन अगेन क्रिएट अ गार्गेंटोम इफेक्ट ईटिंग मोर फ्रेट्स फ्रूट्स वेजिटेबल्स अवॉइडिंग सैचुरेटेड एंड ट्रांसफैट्स एज वेल एज टेकिंग प्रेस्क्राइब मेडिकेशन एंड अटेंडिंग टू हेल्थ केयर प्रोफेशनल्स एंड टेकिंग हेल्थ केयर एडवाइस सीरियसली साइमल्टेनियसली what is ought to be done is an awareness through the government through the state governments as well as the private sector including the ngos about the issues of hypertension and how it is affecting our day to day life in form of increasing morbidity and how we can manage hypertension to avoid these morbidities the next article relates to the uighur region and this pertains to your gs2 international relation now why is it in news is that a uighur scholar has been sentenced to prison now let's look at the region so this is the uighur region or the xinjiang region so it is on the north west of china now at this point we must understand that along the eastern regions of china the coastal china is where the han chinese live which is the majority so the han chinese ethnic majority they live on the coastal regions and these are the uighur are essentially turkish origin muslims who form the minority in this region in the northwestern region also we must understand that these regions are also sparsely populated why because these are difficult terrains we must appreciate that the regions of tibet as well as xinjiang they are sparsely populated because of the difficulties of geography on the other hand the fertile regions of the eastern china are densely populated because of the higher carrying capacity now what china has been doing is it has been suppressing the uighur culture religion and it is also going for human right abuse on the minority that is uighur now they are going for forced assimilation that means you leave whatever culture language script religion you have and you try to follow the han chinese model and go for forced assimilation without will then suppressing of the local culture religion language and also going for mass detention center for the people who do not abide by the norms so they must be disciplined by the government by going for mass detention center and restriction of islamic practices which is the majority religion in this region then going for closure of mosques and going for internment camps where we go for forced reeducation reeducation which can involve cutting of beard way of dressing forcing the use of mandarin and reeducation in terms of schooling 
so all aspects are to be changed in mid life why because the chinese government thinks so and therefore this has been in news globally because of the human rights abuse in this region then there is arbitrary detention of thousands of people then torture forced labor and even organ trade so cheap organs from people who are in these detention center so they act like organ banks then excessive surveillance in form of mass facial recognition and use of artificial intelligence to control the entire population and this region is extremely rich in terms of oil and gas and is also part of the one belt one road therefore it is part of strategic movement of china towards west so china is looking to develop its western regions and also use its large expanse of lands not only for development but also for exploration of minerals and so the uighur region has come on the target and that is why the uighur region also remains in the global news then it is going for enhancing the migration of han chinese to go for demographic changes and this region also suffers from disparity so the classic example of economic disparity can be seen in form of tibet versus coastal china or uighur versus coastal china and this has also strained the china's relation with west including with the us and european union the last article pertains to the asola bhati wildlife sanctuary and this pertains to your gs3 environment now a new study on the asola bhati wildlife sanctuary has been conducted now at this juncture we must also know that asola bhati is also acting as a seed bank a seed bank has been established in this region why because it is part of the aravalli range and so to conserve the local ecosystem a seed bank has been created now let's look at the region so it is nothing but an extension of the aravalli range so whenever we look at the aravalli aravalli are in this shape and so it is more broader in gujarat and it gradually narrows at as it approaches delhi and nearby delhi it breaks into multiple ridges and these ridges are called the delhi ridges now along these delhi ridges is situated the asola bhati wildlife sanctuary now this asola bhati wildlife sanctuary is also part of the sariska leopard range or sariska leopard corridor now this is located in the regions where delhi interfaces with haryana so if we draw delhi like a square so along this region is faridabad and along here is gurugram so the extension of this delhi ridge is all along the gurgaon to faridabad and then finally extending to the ridges of delhi also one good example of the delhi ridge inside delhi is the kamla nehru ridge which is also known as the delhi ridge locally now why this region is important because of the interface so let's say this is a ecosystem and this is a aravalli ecosystem simultaneously let's say there is a river 
river yamuna so what will happen the ecosystem nearby yamuna it will be riverine and what happens when both these ecosystems they merge together so these regions will have more biodiversity and that is why this wildlife sanctuary has been in news multiple times now what are these species so approximately 193 bird species medicinal plants butterflies we have leopards nilgaya black buck and we have near threatened species like red headed vulture egyptian vulture and painted stork and this is one of the last remnants of the delhi ridge why because these are the regions where we have created the concrete jungles of delhi and ncr thank you so much i hope it helped